How y'all doing this morning? Yeah. Oh, sense, um, I'm so glad you could be here. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Jason Helmick. I'm a program manager uh, for PowerShell and also for CloudShell. Uh, I'm also the PM for Crescendo. So I'm glad you came here to talk about Crescendo, yeah? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> now, if this is your first time with Crescendo, don't worry. I'll give you the idea what's going on, that kind of thing. We're going to go through what we shipped and what we're going to ship here soon. And we want all your feedback in the upcoming weeks because we can, you know, we can make adjustments before we ship. So that's why we want to talk about this. Also, um, uh, we've changed. You may be looking at your schedules going, that guy doesn't look like Sean Wheeler. No, that's not Sean Wheeler. I, we, we got very lucky today. And so I'd like, uh, joining us today, I'd like to, to, to introduce you to um, both the inventor and lead engineer for Crescendo. This is Jim True. microphone and and just just tell them who you are I was one of the original um, I was the the first programming team uh, and I was largely responsible with Bruce Bruce and I created the PowerShell scripting language so so all the syntax that you love and perhaps not love is uh, mostly my fault um, <laughs> I also owned a whole large set of uh, behaviors, errors, and some of the pipeline behavior that we have, and uh, formatting. I had, a, I pretty much had a hand in everything um, in the very beginning of time. So I started with the PowerShell team right at the tail end of 2002, very beginning of 2003, and uh, and so I've been around for a while. After uh, about six years of the PowerShell team, I had to, I wanted to go try something else. Uh, so I went to Microsoft Research, and then I did some other stuff on Microsoft. And finally, about five or six years ago, I came back to the PowerShell team, but this time as an engineer. So I've been writing a lot of, so I'd always written a lot of code, even when I was a program manager. I was at the beginning of time. And all, all, and all of the commands and even all that example code was my fault. But this time I came back, uh, I came back as an engineer, so I've been working on improving our tech, test technology, and then I came up with this idea about Crescendo. And so, good. I'm really <laughs> Well, let's talk about it. First of all, before I get into Crescendo, this is going to be, we've got a lot of stuff I want to get to. So some of it I'm going to be able to demo. Some of Part. I don't know how many uh, questions we we'll take as we go through the show, but go ahead and follow Jim on the way out. No talk about anything you want to talk about. The other thing I'd point out is, is he is our Yoda. So if you want to talk to him about anything PowerShell related, especially about the history of it, he's the guy to talk to while you have the chance. So Answer thank your you. Questions? I will. Oh, yeah. How quick and standing. So here we go. Shell Crescendo. I know that you have this world out in front of you and you look at it through a PowerShell lens, but not everybody does. Native commands, those platform specific native commands. Let me give you some examples IP config, IF config, cube control, Docker. You get it? Those native commands run just fine in PowerShell. Full stop. You can run them just as is. However, you may not necessarily enjoy the experience. As a PowerShell person, you might want more. You might want it to actually be a commandlet. You might want it to behave like a commandlet. You so that you can use it easier in your automation. Native commands don't do this. And boy, you want to have some fun. Talk to us about the difficulty in dealing with arbitrary strings. It is a nightmare. So this is why Crescendo exists. You don't have to use Crescendo because everything works fine in PowerShell as is. 
but crescendo might be the thing that helps make your life a little bit easier. So here's what I wanted to do. <laughs> oh, come on. Am I the only Spinal Tap fan here that gets this? Wow. That's painful. So here's what we're going to do just on the concept of what crescendo is. Ready? You better work with me on that. Okay, here we go. First of all, you may have saw the first one the shell on Monday, but let's just use the basics. Here's a native command. IP config, well not config. Um, this is a beautiful command, we run it all the time, it's great, we need it, we need the data on it, yada, yada, yada. I just wish for the love of God I could do this. Where I can grab that IP address in my automation, do something with it, you know, that kind of thing, and it's just not gonna work. Because this arbitrary type, you can't grab all of this, and it's a nightmare to deal with. But what if we could do this instead? What if we could get IP config? Woo! And at the same time, here's the best part. That information is now an object that you can use in the pipeline just like any other PowerShell commandlet at this point. And here's the thing. I'm going to show you a slide that says this in a second, but it's really simple. You do not need to... You do not need to use Crescendo today to achieve that result. You could wrap it yourself. You could use a REST API and create your own code. You could wrap the existing native code. You can do all of that coding yourself. How many of you good at that? How many of you good at wrapping all that stuff yourself? Yeah, see? This is why. How many of you? Let's do it the other way. How many of you are not good at wrapping all this stuff? This is why Crescendo exists. It's a platform to help do this for you. All you have to do, as you're going to see, is fill out a simple configuration file, and Crescendo will do the rest for you. Let me give you another example. Not only will Crescendo do this, of course, this is PowerShell 7. This is awesome. But as everything, I'm sitting next to the Linux guy over here. Of course, here's a Mac. Here's, I'm going to invoke if config. Of course, we can wrap this on Linux and Mac as well. So Crescendo is fully cross-platform. You can wrap the native commands on whatever system you want. And here's the best part. And this is all thanks to Jim right here. Crescendo modules work down in PowerShell 5.1. The idea being, now, now let me tell you, this wasn't easy, so a little. <laughs> uh, the idea being this. Not all of you are on PowerShell 7. You may be on PowerShell 7 on your box, but some of your servers are still running 5.1. If I give you a way to solve the problem with native commands and you're happy about it, you're going to want to use it for things like maybe migrations or maybe fixing some of those servers. We needed to make sure that it worked out level. Yes? And so when Crescendo generates code for you, it's going to generate it so that it runs on 5.1, so that it runs on 7, so that it runs cross-platform. Are we cool? Is that cool? Yeah! yeah. All right. So that's the basics idea behind what Crescendo do. You can wrap your stuff pretty easily and get it to run wherever you want. Taking the arbitrary string nature of native commands and turning it into this beautiful object nature that we also love. So, here's that slide I was telling you about. With Crescendo, you get these amazing benefits. They look, feel, and smell like commandlets. They have help files, just like commandlets. You don't have the help. It's just like a commandlet. You can live with the native tool as is, or you can re it as is. That is the thing. What we wanted this to be was, we already have developers that know how to rewrite it. We wanted to help IT folks that are like, I just need this to work. So that's what this framework is about. Does that kind of sort of make sense? You pick your programs, you set up your programs, it's just, oh. I don't want to belabor it, but 
But we're showing your workflow. This is a really simple thing. You need to end up with a declarative configuration. You hear us talk about declarative configurations a lot. A declarative configuration file, a JSON declarative configuration file. That in that file, here's what you need to tell us. What do you want to call it? What's the verb? Pick a good verb. What's the noun? What do you want to call the parameters? From that, Crescendo will do the rest. You'll run a commandlet, export Crescendo module. Crescendo will then go, generate everything you need for you, technically on the inside. And uh, Jim will tell you more about this if you're curious. It's done with proxy commandlets. And so we generate all of this and shove it into, and it's really small to see, a module. Not just any kind of module, it's a PowerShell module. You also get a manifest with that module, a PSD1. Here's where that module will run. At that point, you are ready to rock and roll. You can publish that anywhere you want. You want to publish it internally? Use it internally? Great. Well, we'd love for you to do, because a lot of people do this, publish it out to the gallery, because you can just use it in your pipelines that way. You just import it from the gallery and use it in the gallery. And here's the best part. You can import it, because I've already told you this, to Windows, Windows PowerShell 5.1. You can port it to PowerShell 7. And of course, all this stuff works in ClownShell. So you can do this in ClownShell, put this stuff up in ClownShell. Your team can now use commandlets that make sense to them, and you've set it up for them. And that's a great job to have tooling. So look at the power that you have, and all you need to do is come up with a declarative. JSON configuration file. Oh, by the way, there's a couple ways you could do this. You could copy one of ours and just modify it. You could handwrite it from scratch. Or we have commandlets and a dot that explains how to use the commandlets to build the JSON file that you can then just hand your shit out. So we gave you commands that will build it as well. Let's dive into a little bit more about this. Crescendo, now what I'm telling you right now is I want to show you some of the things that we originally released with the 1.0 release on Crescendo about a year ago. We are currently coming up to, we have a preview out, we are currently coming up to doing an RC and, re, and doing our next release for Crescendo and that's why we wanted to talk to you to get your feedback if there's anything that we need to know about. Now, first thing I want to show you is uh, Crescendo plus elevation. And this is where I'm going to I'm going to start to ask my friend Jim to help me out here. I'm going to bring up code. And oh, here, let me show you the idea first. Have you guys ever used, oh man, let me show you two ideas that just make me nicer. Have you guys ever used NetSH? Yes. You like using NetSH? Yeah. Uh, NetSH is like its own freaking mini shell, man. You can get lost in that back. All I want to do is turn off the fire. You know, all I want to do is this program to install and I'm having problems and I don't know why I'm having problems getting it to go over the wire. I just want to turn the firewall off for a second to see if that's the problem. So I look up NetSH and now for the rest of the week I'm trying to figure that crap out. That is not helpful. So if you've ever done NetSH and you've seen this, you've done this, you've got NetSH, NetSH, and you maybe you figured out how to turn it off. But when you go to run it, it goes back and goes, ah, dude, you got to be elevated in order to this down. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I hate NetSH. No, don't, don't get me wrong. He does one of the but I hate working with it. So I wrapped it. Because there are a lot of times I just want to turn the firewall off or on. Nothing more than that. Just off and then back on. So I wrapped it. Set wind firewall. Whoops. Wow, where'd you go? Wind. Okay, I swear to God. Let's turn it off. Whoops, not oof. <laughs> I want you to notice something. Set wind firewall. Okay, that's kind of, that makes sense. It's a set curve. It's going to change something. The parameter, switch parameter, off. What do you think it's going to do? This is why I love PowerShell. You can look at it six months later and you understand what it's going to do. So I'm going to hit enter, but here's the best part.
not a good idea. <laughs> in other words, the NSH is not useful to me in scale. This is no longer useful to me in scale. And so how do we do stuff like this? How does this all work? And what does it look like for real? Let me show you kind of what this looks like. And this is where I'm we'll start to ask Jim to come in here and take this. First of all, I want to show you uh, what my wind firewall JSON looks like. There's a couple of things I want to start with, and then I'm going to let Jim just jump in here and go whenever he wants to. First of all, I want you to notice this is what the JSON is. And like I said, there are commands that can help you build this, but at the end of the day, look at how simple. I know it doesn't look simple, but just look for the simplicity here. What verb do you want? You can pick whatever you want, but I got to tell you, if you pick give me something, we're going to yell at you when you import that module. So, <laughs> Set wind firewall, what platform does it run on? In this case, the NSH runs on Windows, but this is the point. You need to tell us what platform this native command runs on so that we can string where this module can be loaded. And if you take a look, here, uh, let me go to no, no, originally first. That's what I want you to execute when you're done. And here's what, you know, this, I need you to also run some additional NetSH commands to get me down into that mini shell at the right level where I can pop that firewall on and off. So I've got, you have to go into the advanced firewall to set the all profiles, because I don't want to do it for just one profile. No, I want to do it. And so then you go to state. Now what I can do is I can go down and start to specify the simple parts of what parameters do I want. I'm going to call it on, it's a switch, or off, it's a switch. That's all I did, and then I exported this, and I was done. We added elevation, and this is where it becomes fun. So you'll see something in here, uh, elevation, that this can do. Now, a couple of other key points. See this thing up here called schema? This is where you get all kinds of tool tips now when you're working with this JSON to help you from making boobs and to help you fill out. But what can I do? We've made this, it just is all for you. So, elevation pops up. What elevation do you want to use? Here's where the funding is. With Windows, we've got this invoke Windows native app with elevation on Linux. We use the Linux system. So, we're using native to the platform. But here's the thing. Elevation side's tricky. Jim, you want to talk about this elevation in the Windows app stuff? The, the Windows elevation <coughs> requires a whole bunch of stuff that you don't normally, normally find on a Unix system. When you run sudo, you, there's a configuration that allows you to run something. But with Windows elevation, we actually do some unnatural acts. It's a helper function that I provide. It's a helper function that I provide to, to mostly get 99% of the elevation working correctly on Windows uh, using, I think it's using start process with the invoca invocation with the appropriate credential. It doesn't always work, but it works in, in most of the time, and certainly with most of the command line tools that, I've been, uh, that, I'm, that I'm aware of. So we, we wind up having to package up an entire payload uh, to the invoke command, which runs all of this. So let me show you. Now, I realize I'm blazing through this because we're, we're kind of put out just we have a document. Thanks to Sean Wheeler, we have documentation on all of this with these examples in it. Yeah? So, um, but here's, let me show you how this would work. You should probably go, okay, well, this is nice. And you've got elevation capabilities because we're going to have that as an issue. I do want to just say to you that the Linux side works flawlessly. The Windows side, we may have some challenges because of Windows. And you may look to different elevators. You can use different ones. You don't have to use ours. That's why this can be replaced with whatever you want down the road if you find something better. So, um, what, well, how do I turn this, though, into a command? Well, let me just show you that real quick before we move on. And I'm going to, 
know, let's minimize him, let's bring him up here, let's do this. I do every I do this stuff in the console, so I apologize. I don't do this in VS Code, it's just not my thing. Uh, however, it would help if I remembered what folder I wanted to be in to do this. Ah, that's it. So, yeah, let's delete those. Delete star dot p star. Goodbye, module. I have no fear. So this is that JSON that I just showed you on screen. Are you with me? How do I turn this JSON into something I can play with and use? It's very simple. Watch. Export. I'm just thinking predictive intelligence. Export. Shindo module. Now, at this point, that's wrong. I'm going to use um, control uh, or alt A to bounce. Oops, no, that's not going to do it. This one, this one. Oh, I screwed up. Oh, now I, I've done something and made it. You know, let me just redo this. I'm going to use uh, alt A to get into these arguments. I want this to be, what do I call it? With a firewall? Yep, that's it. And let me use alt A to bounce down to that argument. And I want to call the module. I don't know, let's call it wind firewall. It doesn't really matter, but yeah, it does. Let's call it wind firewall. Yes, it was. Since they don't exist, I don't need to force them, so I'm just going to do this. Now, how much work have I put into this so far? Crescendo does it. I'm generating all this stuff 
it goes, I, I know how to deal with that. Bap. You get objects for free. So if you work, you could clap at that because that was a lot of work. Um, or again, you. You grab a command as long as it's JSON. This is going to be easy, and that's what we want to show you. And so, like Jim here, first I wanted to show him the fact that one, I, it's going to be hard to show him on the screen, but you can have multiple, in this state, I've got multiple commands defined, right? You can have multiple <laughs> commands. And I'm going to show you what the outputter is here. Uh, I, and then Jim, here's the thing this is my code, so you don't have to like, like my code, but this is. <laughs> so just take a look. Um, the only, instead of that log of how to do all this, I'm just, hey, it's, it's exporting JSON. Take that, convert from JSON. At that point, you're done. What I did is I decided to add a object name on it. So if you're on Git, remember, it's a unique synthetic object. That's it. And it's, it works. <laughs> Tell them why. <laughs> the, there's two. There are two super, one super hard problem that is a computer science problem that just exists and hasn't really been solved. There's a lot of companies that are trying to do it, and they can do it with log files sometimes and other things. But if you have an arbitrary string of text, if a hard, arbitrary page of text, it's really hard to decide what's important and what's not. And then it's really hard to figure out how do I find it on line three in column four and then in this part of the thing, it's on line 35 in column 20. And that problem I didn't solve, and somebody smarter than me is going to solve it eventually when they have you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence and all those other buzzwords. They'll be able to solve this. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure that if you have access to tools that you've already written because you converted the text once, or there are other utilities, uh, there's a utility called JC, on the Unix platform, which converts uh, dozens of different output types, strings, into JSON. Well, PowerShell's really pretty good at converting JSON to an object. We do that. We have commandments for that. So I wanted to be sure that in that sort of environment, you could do this pretty easily. And the last really wonderful thing about this pipeline that you see, this add member type name, is that once you do that, it hooks into our formatting subsystem. So all you need to do is, is write a little bit of a formatting instructions and you'll get tables or lists or custom or whatever you have. We actually have tools on the gallery. One, uh, it's a tool I published a number of years ago. Uh, it's part of the format utils module that you can take, if you construct a pipeline and a table format that you like, so you type you know, pipe your output to a format table and then you construct all the parameters and whatnot. You can change format table to new table format and it will emit the XML for you that you can just put into a file and then use. So you would never have to worry about what's coming out as a table or a list or what have you. You'd have it automatically generated and you can distribute it with the module. It makes it super easy. So it's another tool that's on the, on the, on the gallery that I wrote a billion years ago uh, because I hated doing this all the time, writing all the XML, it's awful. So I built another tool that writes XML for me and now every time that I have an object that is kind of custom, I write the associated formatting for it so I never have to do it again. So this is predominantly what we ship. It's Crescendo 1, 0. There's some other things in that. You can see that from the documentation. But now I want to move quickly into what we're sh about to ship and what's currently available in our preview because here's what happened. We didn't know if anybody felt this was a good idea. And it turns out, a few of you certainly did. We got, within, the, within a few months, we got over 8 million running downloads plus a whole bunch of individual authors. Today we stand at about 17 authors on the gallery. And we are almost near 10 million downloads. Now, if you look at the downloads number, look at hey, some people use this in their automation pipeline. That's why the downloads are so big. But if people go, well, you can't count that, they're going, that was the point to PowerShell. One person automates a thousand things. That means success, guys. Uh, so we've got a lot of downloads, so we wanted to do more, but here's the best part. I love this part. I just most of the ideas that we had for the additions coming in here came from New England. 
people that came out to the repo that were using it told us, hey, could you do this? Could you do that? So here's what I want you to know. Your communication to the PowerShell team matters because that's what we did. Jim sat down, took up these things, and I'm going to show you these. And thanks to the community for bringing these up. The first one is, wow, all this talk I just did about outdoors, we didn't realize this, but sometimes you just want to give up and not have any output. You want to completely bite us. Output. And Jim, can you explain why this happens? We got Pastel up here. Pastel. Remember that issue coming yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for sure. Pastel is a great utility. It provides you a whole, uh, you can describe colors. And it, 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 one of the behaviors of the tool is that depending on the colors that you describe, it emits them to you. And here's what it looks like. So that, that's what this output is. This command gives you this display in Pastel. It knows, Pastel knows whether or not it's in the pipeline. And if it is in the pipeline, it behaves differently. So the thing right beneath there is now we're going to pipe this to the object, but it could have been piped to anything. It knows that it no longer has the console handle as output. And so it says, oh, you don't want this to behave this way anymore. I'll give you the RGB or the HSL in this particular case. Here's, what, here's the instruction for the color. So just putting it in the pipeline changes the tool behavior. And Crescendo was built originally to take everything and just hand it to the output handler. And, and that's a pipeline, and that means that it offered the standard output, the usual output of Pastel, in a way that was not, not great, not, not what we, certainly not what we wanted. So uh, I added a uh, functionality that it doesn't hook up another pipeline, it just simply runs the program and it. it still does all of the parameter binding, it does all of the rest of that. It just enables you to uh, put a pipeline on it explicitly if you want to, but, but by default, if you use bypass, it, it won't add a pipeline at all. So the way this issue came into us, the user said, I just wrapped it in crescendo and did this. I did not get the expected this. I got the unexpected as if it were being piped results. And we were like, well, what? Oh, well, because Katrina sends everything. So the bypass allows you to turn that off. So you will get that. Now, I'm going to show you the code. It's Halo type equals bypass. You can look it up in our documentation. We've got many articles on it. Another thing that we worked on now was argument transformation. So, I have a net use example for this. Don't judge me. So, basically, we want to wrap the net command. I want to use net use, but I want to send credentials to the net use command, which means I need to break apart. If you look at the syntax for net use, you need to break apart. Username, password, very specifically in a sequence by the net use. That's really hard to do. But with argument transformation, and I want to bring this up to you and see if this probably makes sense. You can do the transformations here in the argument transforms, and there's a lot of things you can do. We have a bunch of examples out there of transforming arrays to this or that or this, or you want to put in commas and you don't want to win. You, want, you don't want to put in copies, and then you do want them. All kinds of transformations between how you want the data to go in versus how it needs to be used with the program. You can do all of this. And talk about this. this is one of the biggest questions. Yeah, this is, this is tricky, right? PowerShell has its own notion of what parameters are like, right? So when you say write object 1, 2, 3, 4, that 1, 2, 3, 4 is an array of four integers, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, however, when you call a native application, that native application doesn't want an array, it wants a, a string, which is the string 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what it needs to see. Or it wants to see uh, a key value pair that goes one, uh, uh, the, not the letter, sorry, the word 1 equals 1, comma, the word 2 equals 2. So if you have a hash table, we present a hash table. Hash tables are native application, a native type for PowerShell. But converting that into something that's useful for a native application can be kind of tricky. So I had to come up with a way to provide for that behavior. So the argument transform stuff came up. Uh, I created, and in this particular example, what we're really what we're really seeing is just a simple script block which emits two objects. The first object is the 
one because that's what that uses. And then you need the password as a second, as an additional argument, the next argument. And so this is how you get the password out of a creden out of a credential object. And so this way it generates two arguments for net use out of a single uh, a, a single uh, credential object. So it gets a it gets a little uh, tricky, and it's kind of tricky sometimes to follow it, follow the logic. But it's pretty arbitrary. You can kind of do whatever you want there, and then and then you'll get the uh, ob the arguments passed to the executable correctly. And this is one of several examples that they give you of argument transformations of all the people that came in and went. Could you help us so that we can do this as a transfer? How about this as a transfer? How about this? And we're like, how about we just do them all? <laughs> how about that? Okay, you don't get that. I thought that was a good thing. Um, one other thing I want to show you, and then a, a couple of things to kind of wrap up as we're running out of time. And, and Jim, I, I don't even need to really bring the code up on this. It's more about the concept here of the native error handling. Because this wasn't exactly working the way that we wanted to, and then we needed to fix it. But it's kind of a creative. So, I think it's a creative solution. So one of the, originally in Crescendo, I didn't do anything about errors. They go to standard error and they, you just get them blathered to the screen as they occur. And I didn't really like that, that because sometimes you want to see those errors and then take certain behaviors because of them. So what I wound up doing is one of the things that happens when a native executable emits an error, it actually creates an error record and it has the, the message of the, the string which is the, the, the error that the native executable ex emits, it gets turned into an error record. So what I, so in, in, the new, in the new crescendo, what happens is I take both the output and the errors and I kind of combine them into a single stream. And then I've added a, uh, a, a new kind of inline filter, which then demultiplexes those those two signals, one which is payload, the actual output, and the errors into two different, uh, in, uh, and then I separate them again. So they come together, and then I separate them, and I collect the errors, and you can reference the errors in your code in, the, in your output handlers, and then you can also then format whatever you want to do in, with your regular output. And that way you have kind of the both, best of both worlds, where you have the errors available to you and you can take action based on them but you also have the output like you always have and you can either throw the errors away or you can or you can hold on to them to the end or you can emit them as they come and there's an additional little bit of uh, business I put in the uh, in the in the uh, an additional tool I provided that essentially treats it the same way it's always been treated so it will just emit it as an error and it looks like an, an error record, just like it did in version one. So you have the capacity to have this old, what I would call not great behavior, but if you wanted it, you can still have it. But now you actually have the errors that you can manipulate or dis, uh, ignore or treat as data or what have you now that, uh, in both ways. So that's, that, that's one of the new things and that's coming. We had multiple users come in with this, but the first user to come in to say, hey, we need a little help this was Jeff Hicks who was playing where they're going, hey man, I need to be able to pick up, I need to do something different with my errors and the output handler. I can't figure out how to do this. And it was just like, oh, I got this. And it was tricky. It was tricky to pull this off, but it's pretty cool. So now you can totally control your errors. Like that. Yeah. Kind of cool. I mean, kind of cool. Look, I, I know that we're going through this really fast because it's short time. We've got plenty of documentation, but let me give you just a couple of other things to kind of wrap up. And I want you to be able to have a chance to ask Jim questions. So when there is a call to action, first of all, Jim, thanks a lot for working on this. Hey, I just have a question for you. How cool is it for you to work on this project with me? I mean, I'm an awesome guy. <laughs> it was fantastic. I just want to try to shoot the download from the gallery. Um, this was a real important project for me because throughout my PowerShell career, the greatest pain I had is I am not somebody that's going to sit down and grab a native command like a developer does. And my own personal thank you, Jim, for creating this um, because this would help me in real life. We've got lot, thanks to Sean Wheeler, please, uh, Sean. Thank you so much. We've got tons of documentation. You can join the discussion, folks. Jim and I are talking right now.
about in May. We might flip this to an RC, which means we're on the GA train to ship it out. If you have feedback, if you work with your shindig, you know somebody working with your shindig, go to our GitHub and put your feedback in now so that we can get that all bundled up. We want to get this out to you, and we want to make it available as uh, 1.1. I have one other thing for you, though. Um, I want you to consider how we're doing on time. Great, this is perfect. Um, I, I, I want to point something out. If you go to our repo, there's a folder out there. I think it's called an assets folder. Inside of that assets folder, I created a whole bunch of crescendo icons, and somebody yelled at me. Yeah, so the crescendo icon I put out there, I started getting yelled at about. So I'm feeling a little not ha Well, here's what I need you to do. I need you, if you care, you don't have to care, but if you care, it will help. I'm going to show you a picture of two crescendo icons. I need you to tell me which is the right one to use. Now, don't say a word yet. I'm going to show it to you. Don't say a word yet. Are you with me? Yeah. First person that says a word, I swear to God, I'm going to kick. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't say a word yet. Oh my God. <laughs> While you're looking at the crescendo icons, I just want you to know that you're about to be judged by. That's a picture of Jim Truer. By the way, he's still a working symphony conductor. And when. When we were working on this project, at one point we had to come up with a name for it, and Jim's like, that's your job. And I'm like, I got this, girl. So it's crescendo. And so the question is, what is actually the correct crescendo icon that we should have up on GitHub? And you want to tell me at some point what you think? Uh, top versus bottom. Who? How many people think it should be the top one? And how many people think it should be the bottom one? Please feel free. I'm going to shut my mouth. Feel free to talk to Jim Truer. Thank you so much for being here and try out Crescendo.